Good morning and welcome to Marine View Church Online. My name is Jesse Skiffington and I serve as pastor here at Marine View. And at Marine View, our mission is to create environments where each person is mobilized to go deeper with Jesus and to reach wider with his love. Uh, we believe that as we follow Jesus, as we get to know uh, Jesus and his heart and his love for us, and as we learn from him, that Jesus' love is going to grow inside of us too. And then that love is going to spill out of us into the world around us. And we call that going deeper, reaching wider. Today we're going to continue in our summer sermon series. We're kind of coming toward the end of the summer, I'm sorry to say, but we're looking at the first nine chapters of the book of Acts in the New Testament and looking at um, sort of the early Christian movement and what happened there. And we called the series Movement or this new movement as uh, the early Christians, these believers in Jesus, received a mission from Jesus to be his witnesses. And there were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, in these ever-widening circles. And so for the first seven chapters of Acts, this movement has centered in Jerusalem itself. As the apostles shared the good news about Jesus, people there were responding, they were believing, and they were being baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of their sin, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. And then last week, we saw some things that kind of boiled over, how some of the external challenges facing this new community kind of came to a head with the brutal death of Stephen, the first Christian martyr. And when Stephen was killed, everything was immediately different. Things changed in an instant. And there was no going back to the earlier days when the church had enjoyed the favor of all the people. There was no going back to the way things were. This disruption of the status quo was so severe that the church had no choice but to adapt. And we're going to look at that today. So as we get started, I want you to think about change for a minute. Change is hard. Even change that leads to something good, it's hard. That's because change is often experienced as loss. We go from what we knew and what we had to something new and different. When you move to a new town or a new home, there's something maybe exciting about the change, the new adventure, but there's also something of a loss of what was known, what was comfortable, what was familiar. We're thinking about uh, this past couple of weeks, the loss of the Pac-12 and college football, 108 years of history and rivalries and all that's been upended. And there's something kind of exciting for me as a Husky fan to see what happens next. But it's also sad. It's, it's a loss as these teams have kind of gone their different ways. If you struggle with change, I got to tell you, you're not alone. Because if change is experienced as loss, then there's some grief involved in it too. And after a while, we just rather not go through that. I don't want to change anything else or anything more. I don't want to go through that loss and, and all of that. So better just not to change. But there are times when, and we know this because we live life, when we have no choice about change. Change just happens. Whether we're ready for it, whether we expect it, or whether we want it or not. We found out maybe about a round of layoffs at work. We can't control that. Change happens. A close friend is moving to another town. Or maybe our, our favorite player gets traded or a health crisis pops up and uh, that kind of disrupts our lives. What do we do with change when maybe it's not change we want? Uh, there's a book uh, called Canoeing the Mountains by author and professor of leadership at Fuller Seminary, Todd Bolsinger. And uh, it's called Canoeing the Mountains. And uh, Bolsinger uses the illustration of Lewis and Clark, the Lewis and Clark expedition, uh, that, uh, that kind of talks about the nature of change and what we can do with it. Lewis and Clark thought that they were heading west to canoe the rivers and waterways until they discovered the Northwest Passage. It was thought that there would certainly be a waterway that connected the east and west coasts, the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. But what they didn't know before they left on their journey was that there was a giant mountain range in between. The Rocky Mountains stood in their way. And so when they arrived at the Rockies, they didn't need expert canoers anymore. They had to learn to adapt to to become something different, to become mountain climbers. They needed to adapt in the face of change. They could choose to turn back and give up, or they could adapt and embrace the new opportunities in front of them that came with the change and see what happened. And that's what they did. And the rest is, of course, told in history. They had to exchange their canoes for a rock climbing harness, you could might say. Here's the thing, though. When you're faced with change, what do you do? Maybe you take a moment to grieve the loss, but then adapt. In the face of change, there's an opportunity to learn a new way to navigate or develop new tools and new skills for the experience that you're facing now. And if you're willing to see it, change actually presents an opportunity for God to be at work in and through us in a new way, to break us free from our comfort zones and the status quo. I get it. It's hard, and it comes with an experience of loss. But if you're willing and open, God is going to help you adapt. 
so that you can thrive and flourish, and that you, so that you can love him and those around you in whatever this new setting might be. I want you to think about the early church uh, for a moment. Um, we've been looking at the early church all through the summer, and there had been some external challenges, some internal challenges, but for the most part, everything in their life had been up and to the right, meaning that things were good, things were growing. This was a growing, healthy community. The gospel was being preached. They were serving as witnesses in Jerusalem, as Jesus said they should, and they were settling into that mission. But the mission, you might remember, was supposed to be more about more than just Jerusalem, wasn't it? Jesus had said, you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, the area around Jerusalem, and Samaria, a little further out, and to the ends of the earth. And here it is that we find this place in our passage that it's going to show just how dramatically things change from the church, from kind of being in Jerusalem and, and tied to that place to a new phase of the movement that began with what, on the face of it, this change that happened seemed maybe like a setback to them, an extremely painful one at that. But God was going to do something in the midst of that change. So open your Bibles up to Acts chapter 8, and we're going to look at the disruption and change that the early Christian community faced and what happened as a result. God was going to open up new opportunities for them that they otherwise may not have uh, received or maybe wouldn't have explored. Disruption can actually be a good thing if we're willing to see it that way. Here, of course, this disruption begins with an incredibly painful thing, not a good thing. Stephen is killed for his faith. A great persecution breaks out against the church. And this is a hard thing that's going to lead to some new opportunities, this change. And this is what Luke writes right after Stephen has uh, died for his faith. Luke writes, On that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church. Going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. Then listen, those who were scattered preached the word wherever they went. Talk about a backfire. The religious leaders saw they pushed back against the early church and by all appearances with Stephen's death and sort of the resulting flood of persecution against the church, it looked like maybe they had succeeded and stemming the tide of this new movement. The church was scattered throughout Judea and into Samaria. And Luke tells us that Stephen was mourned. And he reminds us that Saul was there. And now the opposition to, the, to this new movement, the church, has gotten organized. And, and Saul's organizing this persecution of the church. And there's a real world consequence to following Jesus. And Christians, those who had, left, had not left town, they're being systematically arrested and imprisoned. And it results in the scattering of the community. But the persecution, we find, did not have the intended effect. Because those who were scattered kept talking about Jesus. They kept living out the, the mission Jesus had given them to be his witnesses. Now, the setting had changed, certainly. But the mission to be witnesses and the message about Jesus did not change. It was the same message, just a different environment to share it in. The gospel message was like seeds scattered by a farmer. It was going to spread throughout Judea and Samaria. It was not a setback after all, but instead it was a new opportunity for the gospel message to be shared with even more people, for this community to move forward in its mission to be Christ's witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and eventually to the ends of the earth. Now, when you face change or your life is disrupted in some way, remember what happened with the early church. What seemed like a setback was really an opportunity for God to work through them in a new place. Disruption can often lead to unforeseen opportunities, things that God might want to do in us or through us. And we might even say that without disruption, we can easily just stay in the comfort of the status quo and miss out on what God may want to do through us. It doesn't make all change good or the disruption good. We can go through some really hard things that lead us to a new place, but we open to the opportunities for God to work through us or to do something new in us. When the pandemic came, it upended so much of our life together as a church family. And it did in so many areas across the whole of our lives. But it also had the effect of kind of causing all of us to stop and evaluate where it really matters, to rediscover the joy of community and to simplify things and to focus on relationships on what really counts. Our relationship with Jesus and one another. And that disruption, as hard as it was, might have led to some good things in us. What might a disruption lead to in your life and faith? So the church had scattered, and now Luke is going to tell us about one of those scattered followers and what God do th 
did through him specifically. And this is a, an example of what it looked like when Philip, one of the seven who had been selected by the early church and given the responsibility of overseeing the distribution of food in the community, when Philip left Jerusalem and he went to a city in Samaria to share the gospel. So this is what Luke writes about this specific example of one of the followers that was scattered. Luke writes, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the, uh, proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they all paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. So there was great joy in the city. Now, for some time, a man named Simon had practiced sorcery in the city and amazed all the people of Samaria. He boasted that he was someone great, and all the people, both high and low, gave him their attention and exclaimed, This man is rightly called the great power of God. They followed him because he had amazed them for a long time with his sorcery. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news of the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Simon himself believed and was baptized, and he followed Philip everywhere astonished by the great signs and miracles he saw. Now, there are several things going on here. Um, of course, there is this message being proclaimed to the Samaritans, and we get to hear about the message and the reception, and, and there's this Simon the sorcerer, whoever he is, and, and then there's the belief of both the crowds and, and Simon, and they're baptized. And so we're going to look at these. We're going to just take them one at a time briefly. The Samaritans, Simon, the reception of the gospel. So first, although Jesus had said that his followers would be his witnesses in Samaria, I imagine that seemed like an odd thing to say, an odd thought. History tells us that the Jews and Samaritans didn't get along. They were enemies. They were rivals. They were culturally and racially different. They had shared a common heritage that went way back to the time of Abraham and Moses and all of that, and certainly even up to the time of King David and King Solomon when the northern and southern tribes of Israel had divided. When the northern kingdom went and established its capital in Samaria and the southern kingdom uh, established its capital in Jerusalem. And the northern kingdom, was the, the people were carried off into exile. And those who had remained in the land uh, had married with uh, people from groups around them, had blended together other religions and beliefs with those around them. And they, they were married into other cultures. And so for a thousand or so years, this divide had grown between the Jews and Samaritans along cultural and religious and even racial lines. And so you have vastly different groups of people by this point that have had generations of conflict and hatred, frankly, toward one another. But Jesus had engaged with the Samaritans in his ministry, hadn't he? Sharing the news about who he was and who he is with a Samaritan woman at Jacob's well. And she told her neighbors who also believed. Jesus had stopped in Samaritan towns on his way to and from Jerusalem and had used a good Samaritan as an example in his teaching about what it means to, to really actually love your neighbor as yourself. But still, Samaritan converts and Jewish converts living in a new community in the church together, that seemed like a stretch, I imagine. But here it was. Philip was preaching the gospel in Samaria, the fulfillment of Jesus' words as Philip witnessed to the Samaritans, and they believed and were baptized. Now, we get this amazing moment when the Samaritans are coming into the church and what that must have been like, uh, but we also in the passage meet one Samaritan in particular, a, a guy named Simon the Sorcerer. You may have heard him referred to as Simon Magus or Simon the magi Magician. Simon had drawn a crowd through his sorcery. Luke tells us that he did some kind of remarkable things, and he would have been wealthy and probably influential as a result, and the people considered him to be, it appears, something of a god among them, someone great, and he himself boasted that he was someone great. But when Philip arrived, and the signs and wonders that happened as the Spirit worked through him were even greater than those of Simon, the people took notice. Simon took notice, and the crowds believed Philip about Jesus. And Simon himself believed Philip about Jesus. And then we saw Simon following Philip everywhere he went. Now, notice the reception of the gospel. It happens as people are healed, as they're set free. There's joy in the city, Luke writes. And in Philip's message there, we see something of what we might call mass evangelism as he preaches to the crowds. He shares the gospel with the people there. And there's a clear response by a large group of them to believe and be baptized. 
Now, next week, we're going to see a different approach from Philip as he goes to one individual with the gospel, a more personal, one-on-one -on -one style of evangelism. But for the Samaritans, there appears to have been a readiness to believe based on the message, the signs, and the movement of the Spirit. There was a response to the gospel. And Philip was there sharing that message, helping them see who Jesus really is. And I think it's worth mentioning here that when we share the gospel, we're going to encounter surprises. We're going to experience people who respond to the message that may surprise us by their response. I mean, Samaritans, really? Simon the sorcerer, really? When we go out and we're scattered and we find ourselves uh, meeting people from different kinds of places and different backgrounds and different experiences and we share the good news of God's love with them, and we share the gospel and we're sharing it with people who have all kinds of other things in their lives that they're coming from as well. They're going to be coming from something else to Jesus. Sometimes we might be surprised by those who respond to the gospel. The reception of the gospel by the Samaritans, it was a big moment and a big shift in the makeup of the church. And when the apostles back in Jerusalem heard what had happened, Luke tells us that two of the most prominent leaders of this new movement, this community, went to investigate. This is what Luke writes in light of this mass conversion of, of Samaritans coming to Jesus, putting their faith in him. Luke writes, when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers. Uh, th they prayed for the new believers there that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them yet. They had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, I think it's important to note that it's Peter and John who go to Samaria to see what's happened. And we notice something unusual has happened here in the manner of the Samaritans' conversion and how their faith, coming to faith, worked. Earlier in Acts, Peter had said that all was needed uh, to, to be a follower of Jesus is to repent and believe and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you would receive the Holy Spirit. And those, those kind of went together. The Holy Spirit would be received upon this confession of faith, this turning to Jesus and, and through this baptism. But here the Spirit is received when Peter and John place their hands on them. There's sort of a, a separation between uh, the event of their belief and uh, receiving the Spirit. And I think it's this unique moment calls for a notable conversion story. And when Peter and John lay their hands on the Samaritans and the Holy Spirit is received, it's as if they're saying, now these Samaritans are fully included as part of the church family, fully and completely. It's a, an incredibly unique moment in, in the history of the church as these two groups are going to come together now. And it kind of took an unusual or uh, a notable conversion experience to, to set that apart. Not long before Jesus' ministry, I, I think it's important to say, John had wanted to call down fire from heaven to destroy a Samaritan town, only to be rebuked by Jesus. He wanted to call down fire from heaven. And now in an amazing turn of events, it's John, along with Peter, who's there in Samaria, and they're laying their hands on them and legitimizing and verifying the faith of the very ones he had despised before, and they lay their hands on them to receive the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful picture. It's a snapshot of the power of the gospel to heal. In this moment, we see a picture of what the gospel can do. The gospel has the power to heal deep divisions. The redemption of the, the Samaritans through the gospel of Jesus Christ has the effect of bringing them back into the family of God, bringing them back into relationships with those they had been severed from. And they find new relationship with their brothers and sisters in Christ that had come from the Jewish community. Those who had grown up as Jews and Samaritans, rivals, even enemies, now they share the same faith in Jesus Christ, share the same table, the same forgiveness of sins, the same Holy Spirit that unites them and makes them one new community. This is a great surprise, and it's a wonder, and it's the beauty of the gospel, the power to heal, to heal the vision. And one day, people will come from east and west and north and south, from all nations under heaven, and they will sit together at the table in the kingdom of heaven. What a day that will be when all those things that divide us are healed in Jesus. Now, I wonder, as you think about Peter and John and the Samaritans, who would you be surprised to see show up in church? Maybe Peter and John and the others were like, wait, the Samaritans believe they're coming to church now? Would you be glad they came? Someone that would surprise you if they showed up? What kind of reception would you give them? Now, we know the right answer. God loves everybody, and everybody's our neighbor, and we should want everybody to come to church. But would there be someone you'd be surprised to see? 
Maybe someone like John <laughs> is a group that you really struggle to love that maybe you'd have a hard time seeing show up. Remember that you are loved by Jesus. You're called to love the people that Jesus loves, all of them. It made all the difference for the Samaritans when Philip and Peter and John showed up to love them, to share Jesus with them. It changed them forever. It changed their lives. Who knows what God might do through you as you love those around you, whoever they are. So back to our account. Luke tells us that Peter and John showed up and sort of legitimized the Samaritan community and their faith, and the Holy Spirit comes. And Luke tells us that though many hearts and lives were changed, not everyone's heart was quite right that day. Once again, we find Simon enter the story in Luke's account. This time, not for his belief, but for an agenda that reflected a not-so-great heart. This is what Luke writes. He says, When Simon saw the Holy Spirit was given at the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money and said, Give me also this ability, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the thing. You can be brand new to church. You can be brand new to the story and have never heard anything about Jesus or the apostles or Simon the sorcerer, and you would immediately know that this request is out of bounds. Simon's request is out of bounds. It's out of line. In fact, later on, a sin is going to be named after Simon. It's called simony, the buying or selling of church privileges, what we might call uh, church favors. He wanted to buy the power to confer the Holy Spirit. It'd be like trying to buy your forgiveness. It would be like someone coming maybe to our nominating committee at the church and offering them money so that they would be nominated to serve as an elder, nominated to, to a role by not because they had earned it through a calling, but because of the money they were willing to give. But Simon, who appears to be concerned about maintaining his reputation as a great power in the world, he wants to buy what the apostles have. It's simony. It's the sin of trying to purchase a benefit of life in Christ. But as you might guess, it cannot be bought. Luke records Peter's response. Peter answered, May your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. You have no part in this ministry because your heart is not right before God. Repent of this wickedness and pray to the Lord in the hope that he may forgive you for having such a thought in your heart. For I see that you are full of bitterness and captive to sin. Then Simon answered, pray to the Lord for me so that nothing you have said may happen to me. I think Simon sort of, that got his attention, at least sort of. And he asked Peter to pray for him so that bad things that he had said might not happen to him. And maybe he was thinking, Peter, you're closer to God. Would you get me out of this? But it should go without saying. But I think embarrassing in light of the fact that Luke includes Simon as sort of an anti-hero, what not to do, an example of what not to do. And his simony is here and prominently in Acts as a warning to us. And it's somewhat obvious, but I think we should say it. Be careful not to use God in an attempt to further your own agenda. Your personal agenda for reputation or power or influence or to look good for other people, all of that can take a hold in our hearts if we're not careful. And we might even, without even intentionally maybe doing it, uh, we can use God by kind of putting on a show of godliness and spirituality because we want to look good to others or have a place of importance in the community. Remember what Jesus said. He said the first will be last and the last will be first. He didn't come to be served but to serve. Humility is the way forward. We can't buy God's good graces. We can't buy the gift of God. He gives it to us freely. After dealing with Simon, um, Peter, in, in that account, Luke concludes this, this record here about what happened as the gospel went out. He says, after they had further proclaimed the word of the Lord and testified about Jesus, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. I love it. They had gone about the mission that Jesus had given them. After they had testified about Jesus, they were his witnesses in Samaria. And Peter and John returned to Jerusalem. The church was scattered, but it did not have the effect of ending the movement. Instead, it spread even faster. The gospel had spread to the Samaritans, just as Jesus had said it would. Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. Now, as we wrap up today, I want to kind of just make a couple of observations as we come to the end of the message. And I hope that will serve as maybe helpful takeaways for you for application this week, maybe as you uh, go deeper with Jesus and as you reach wider with his love. 
Here's the early church faced with what seemed like a setback. They're faced with this dramatic disruptive change that actually in the end opened up new opportunities for them to share the gospel, to live for Jesus. And it reminds me that in my own life and faith and in your own life and faith that sometimes we need disruption to push us where we would probably not go on our own. It doesn't always make the change good or the thing that happened good, but it does provide some new opportunities if we're willing to see it. Another way to put it is this. Sometimes we need a disruption in order to break free from the status quo. Change, as hard as it is and as painful as it can be at time, times, may cause us to stand up and move from where we are, where we were and, and to move forward. It, it doesn't necessarily mean that the disruption was something that we should have wanted and it might even be an awful thing. But in the face of that change, we have a choice, don't we? We have a choice. We can trust God and move forward into the future, uncertain as it might seem. We can trust God and start learning how to climb mountains. We may have to set aside the canoe and pick up a rope and a harness and find a guide and keep moving. Lewis and Clark didn't ask for the Rocky Mountains. They could have turned back, had a choice to make, and they chose to keep moving forward with courage to look for the opportunities that might come next, to see what God might do. When we face change, Here's the thing. We can't go back. We can't live in the past. We can't go back to the way things were. It's an impossibility. We can, if we're not careful, we can get stuck living with our eyes glued to the rearview mirror, looking back, longing for what once was. But as my friend Jason often says, there's a reason why the windshield is bigger than the rearview mirror. In the face of change, we can trust the Lord and look forward to what he might do in our lives. Trust that he'll be with us and comfort us and help us and strengthen us and give us courage, whatever comes next. So let's learn from the early church. Let's learn from Philip and Peter and John and all those Samaritans who believed. When change occurs, disruption comes, even something hard that feels like a setback or shatters the way your life once was. When change occurs, will you look for the new opportunities that God will provide? Move forward in faith. Trust that the Lord is with you, that he has given you hope and a future. You see, no matter what comes, whatever comes next, God loves you. God sent his son Jesus into the world for you. The Lord God has given you the Holy Spirit as a comfort, a counselor, and a guide for the journey ahead through this life. You can know God's love and goodness in your life now, right now, whatever the circumstance, and you have the hope and joy of eternal life to come. You have something amazing to look forward to. When change occurs, when disruption upends the status quo in your life, remember that you are loved by the unchanging God who was and who is and who is to come. The one we serve and the one we follow is with us. He has not left us alone. Jesus is with you just as he was with the scattered church in the early days of the Christian movement. Next week, we're going to come back and we're going to see how that movement continues. And we're going to see an account where we get to see how this gospel is even going to go further than Samaria, this time to the very ends of the earth. Once again, we're going to find Philip at the heart of the story, sharing the good news about Jesus uh, in a talk that we might call jogging for Jesus, although that's a little facetious. Don't miss it. We're going to find this amazing account of Philip sharing the gospel with the Ethiopian. Uh, in the meantime, let's pray. Let's ask the Lord to help us face the change in our lives. Uh, let's remember that the Lord is with us as we move forward. Uh, let's ask God to remind us of who he is, to comfort us through his spirit, and give us eyes to see the new opportunities in front of us. Let's ask God to help us trust him, even as we face the hard work of navigating through disruption and change. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for the ways you are faithful to us, to your church. Thank you, Jesus, for what you've done for us. You have been faithful to us and committed to us from the very beginning to be with us. You gave us a, a, a new mission to be your witnesses in the world. Sometimes change is hard. Sometimes change hurts. It's disruptive. And sometimes change, we experience it as loss, or maybe it involves a very real loss in our lives. There's grief attached to that. So Lord, help us to move through change with our eyes on you, looking for the opportunities you might provide next. Help us to trust you by knowing that we are loved by you, that you are present with us, and that we have a life with you now and forever to look forward to. Lord, would you give us the ability in the face of change to trust you, to seek out those new opportunities to love and serve you and, and those around us well. Help us, Lord, to be adaptable, 
to figure out how to navigate in this new way. I thank you, Lord, that you're with us. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear the things that you'd put in front of us. I thank you, God, that you are the unchanging God who was and is and is to come. You're the one who is with us, Lord Jesus. And we give you thanks for that gift and that promise. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Thank you.